Mask of a Diva, a Stan Krejcik Mystery, Book 4, 1994. Author, Grant Michaels, publisher, St. Martin's Press, New York. Author, Eric Ost. For all the divas, operatic and otherwise. Chapter 36. First thing I did at the Opera House was go to the box office and confirm the tickets I'd reserved for Nicole and Branco. My karma was working well, as it usually did, whenever I helped others. They were fabulous seats, 12th row, orchestra on a center aisle. If they'd been for my own use, the seats would probably have been somewhere in the topmost balcony, along a sidewall with an obstructed view. The posted schedule for that night read OCA Plus, Dress Rehearsal, which translated to the penultimate moment before opening night for everyone involved in the production. Orchestra, chorus, principal artist, and other singers. All done up for a real show. And there would be a nearly full house, too, comprising festival benefactors and friends of the cast. Along with the hordes of critics and students, I knew Daphne would be sitting among the festival dignitaries. Before settling down in the wig room for the long stint ahead of me, I wandered upstairs to the backstage area. Rhonda Luca was there, I guess, by that point. In the production schedule, she pretty much lived, ate, and slept backstage. You're here already, she said. I saw you in the cafe with that cop friend of yours. Too bad he has a girlfriend, huh? The girlfriend is my boss, I said. Oh, so maybe there's still a chance for you two? I shook my head. No. He's straight. Rhonda smoked and said, You never know. I said, You got your props all in order? Knives sharp? Hey, nip it. I told you before, I do. I had nothing to do with any of that stuff. You must be happy that the moment you've been waiting for is just about here. What moment is that? April Kilkis will have her big debut, and all your work will finally come to fruition. Rhonda looked sideways at me. What are you talking about? You confess up, I said. I know all about it. With April's success comes Carolyn's success, and with Carolyn's success comes your chance for love. Rhonda said... I think you got me confused with you and the cop. Admit it, Rhonda, you love her. Who? Carolyn. I already told you I do, but she's straight, just like your cop. The best I can hope for is that she has a satisfying life. But like you said about my cop, Rhonda, you never know. What is it with you? You think everybody in the world is gay like us? Ten percent, I said. Well, figure it out then, she said. Ten percent of everybody here. It's higher in the theater. Look, said Rhonda, I told you before, I didn't kill anybody, okay? You're obviously stuck on finding a killer to please the lieutenant, but I'm not talking, taking a bum rap just so you look good to a cop. You'll have to go find some other sucker. I guess I will, I said, but there's a killer loose, and I'm still not sure how far you'd go to please Carolyn. Maybe that's the kind of motive a gay man would have, but me, personally, I would never kill for love. It's too chancy. I might do it for something more tangible, like, though, like money or property, but it would have to be worth millions. Then I'd go looking for love afterwards. you got to be practical about these things. Who kills just for love anymore? Someone did, I said. You got it wrong, said Rhonda. There's all kinds of love. Rhonda hesitated. You know, maybe you got that right after all. I went downstairs to ready myself and the wigs for the first group of singers for Act One. My assistant was already there, too, a former stylist for the Radio City Rockettes. She was setting up her station, and she radiated that perfect combination of friendliness and professionalism that was going to make working together an easy pleasure. I reminded her always to ask before using hairspray around the singers, then I showed her how I had organized the wig room to match the order of the costuming schedule. It was as close to an assembly line as I could manage, so we lose very little time running around searching for wigs. Gradually, as more and more singers arrived and curtain time approached, the wig room became an, as bustling and exciting a place as the noisy corridors that interconnected the warm-up rooms among all the singers. Although the principals had their own personal makeup artists to fit their wigs, my assistant and I had just as important a job of fixing wigs properly to all the chorus members and the compromarios. We had a lot more opportunity for fun as well. At one point, 
I overheard one of the noisy male chorus singers telling another one that on his way into the opera house he had seen Bruce David, the original tenor who had been institutionalized after Marcella Ostinata's murder. And he's in a wheelchair, squealed the singer. Can you imagine? He's probably planning to make a big fuss during Ricardo's first area, just like what Callis did to Tibaldi. Our work proceeded easily until curtain time. After that, we got to watch the stage action on the AV monitor in the wig room. Everything was progressing smoothly until the momentary pause before Ricardo's first area. That's when some loony ran all the way from the back of the house down to the front row yelling, Viva Marcella! Sure enough, it turned out to be Bruce David. Apparently, the wheelchair was a prop to ensure he'd have a clear run down the center aisle. He was summarily dragged from the theater, screaming Italian expletives. The tenor on stage tried to regain his composure as the orchestra repeated the introduction to his area. He faltered slightly on his first few notes, but then he was back on solid ground. My assistant and I watched a few more scenes on the monitor, but after that, the wig room began to feel claustrophobic. There would be no rush of work for a while, so I told my assistant I was going upstairs to watch from backstage. I figured she should get the sense of being in charge down here, since that's exactly what she would be doing in a few days, when she would have her own assistant and I would be jetting my way to Paris to be reunited with my spouse. When I got backstage, the chorus was well into their big number, just prior to the scene in the fortune teller's cave. I mean, the New Age healing workshop. That scene would require a radical set change, so things were about to get kind of hectic back there. That's when I spied a most unlikely observer in a faraway corner of the backstage area. Mathelda Marceau, former maid to the late Madame Ostinata. She was standing near a marked exit door that opened onto a rarely used stairwell. She seemed to be looking for someone amidst the bustling set crew. Then she waved to someone and I looked to see who it was. It was Rick Jansen. They disappeared together quickly into the stairwell, so there was a connection, maybe even a conspiracy among John Byers and Rick and Mathelda. There was no time to figure out their motive. There was nothing to do but follow. And what a shock to find them on the next landing up the stairwell, both down the floor, struggling against each other. Rick was trying to strangle the woman. I went to break them up, and he pushed me away. Get out of here, he yelled. Get out! But I persisted until he got up and ran down to the backstage area. I asked Mathilda what had happened. Nothing, she said quickly. A, a mistake. But I noticed her concealing something in a tightly clenched fist. What have you got there? I said. Nothing. Come on, let me see. It's not your business, she said sharply. It is now, I said, and then just like something prudish that Brinko might do, I pried her small hand open, lying on her palm with a solid gold cigarette lighter. I recognized it as the one that the maestro had used for a short while. Where did you get this? Mathilda said, I find it. Where? Here in the opera house. Why didn't you turn it in? She made a loud cackle. Because I know the value of such things. Who are you blackmailing? Mathilda spat her reply. You are very stupid. I grabbed the lighter from her hand and ran from the stairwell to Rhonda Luca's desk backstage. Mathilda was right behind me. I asked Rhonda, can you get an usher to alert someone in a curtain seat from back here? Depends, said Rhonda. It's Lieutenant Branko, I said. Mathelda had arrived at Rhonda's desk. You have something that belongs to me, she said. Ah, oh, contraire, I said. Anyone but you. What's the message, said Rhonda. Tell Branko to come backstage immediately. There must have been something incontestable about my manner because Rhonda cooperated without a beat's pause. Sure, she said. Do you know a seat number? I told her, and she put a call out to the debt box office to get an usher to find Branko in the house. Mathilda said, If you do not return that object, I will tell the police. Just wait a minute, honey, I said, and you can tell them the whole story. I pressed the lighter into Rhonda's hand. For Branko, I said. She glanced at it and replied, When's the wedding? Meanwhile, 
my brain was trying to figure out why Rick had been trying to kill Mathelda. Was he protecting John Byers? As far as I knew, at that moment, Byers was sitting in the last row of the audience, taking notes on the performance in progress. Which one of them was behaving like a criminal? The one doing his job, or the one running away? At that moment, I made a decision. I said to Rhonda, Which way did Rick go? She pointed toward the lock rail that secured all the cables running up to the flies. That's where I saw him last, she said. Why? I got a feeling he might be the man, not Byers. Mavelda began to walk away. I said to Rhonda, Can you keep an eye on her? Trouble? Major, I said. Rhonda yelled, Hey, Vinny, grab that woman, will you? Mathelda resisted, but was no match for the massive musculature of Vinny the floorman. I scanned the backstage area frantically. Rick was nowhere around the lock rail. For some reason, maybe because of all the cables running up to the heavens, I looked upward too, and damn, there he was on his way up a ladder to the catwalks high above the stage. I headed toward the same ladder. Just then, Rhonda's headset beat. She listened a moment, then called out to me. Hey, Tinkerbell! Your girl needs you down in the wig room. Tell her she's on her own, I called back. Where do you think you're going? I'm not sure, doll, but it looks like I'm taking the Hellbound Express to get there. You can't go up there, she said. You're not in the Union. So file a grievance. Runda said, I can't hold the curtain while you guys play hide-and-seek up there. Just tell Renko where I've gone. And then began the long climb. A Gay Mysteries Audiobooks I think it is easy to hate a label, but a face humanizes the word. So this effort is twofold. To offer comfort to those like myself that your world didn't end because you don't fit into the view of acceptable society on both sides. And in hopes of helping those with family that are LGBTQ, that it doesn't mean we are aliens from the child they once knew. Reassure them so they can maybe be supportive at the same time being true to their values.